It's overbooked time. In today's episode, we are going to talk about chapters one through three. So if you haven't read the first few chapters of our podcast book club title, The Glass Ocean, hit pause, go read for an hour, and then join us to discuss. EJ and I have finished our reading, so we'll jump right in. How did you like the book so far, EJ? Well, Abby, I have to say I was pleasantly surprised so far. So in the first chapter, we kind of meet Sarah, right? And we are in New York City in May 2013. Sarah is an author who is or seems to be quite scattered, maybe not as put together as she wants to be. At least that's the impression we get in the first couple of pages. She definitely wants to be the right amount of casual. Changes her outfit several times. She says she doesn't care about what this book club thinks, but it's pretty obvious within several seconds of meeting the book club that she cares because of how many times she apologizes to the club. But then she gets even more upset. She ends out storming out because they don't buy her book. This whole book club has pirated her first book called Small Potatoes. And they've pirated the whole book. And she's just, she's not on board with that at all. And so she has a little bit of a fit. And she knows that she has to keep writing. So she really wants to find another thing to write about and I think the experience at the book club really just motivated her even more to do so what about you Abby do you have any thoughts on chapter one or your overall impression of Sarah yeah sure my favorite part of chapter one was the end of chapter one when she discovers the cryptic note no more betrayals And I was like, whoa, that's kind of when I knew what kind of book we were getting into, aka short chapters, cliffhangers. And so I thought this is going to be a fun read, an easy read. And I just wanted to know who was the betrayals. I mean, of course, the word betrayal for me is a huge like love story, craziness, triangle type thing. But, you know, we don't know who wrote the note, who received the note even. So... That was the last page of the chapter, so I immediately wanted to jump in and see what was going to happen next. Yeah, I totally agree. That moment where she finds the chest that she's, you know, not supposed to go into or wasn't supposed to as a child, and that sort of reveals some history into her family. Her great-grandfather's name was Patrick Houlihan. He was a steward on the RMS Lusitania. And we get this mysterious note, like Abby said, and we have just a date, May 6th, 1915. That's when that kind of mysterious note in the chest is from. And that's where we leave chapter one. So that's where we leave Sarah. And we head to New York City in April of 1915. So we get to go back in time. And in chapter two, we are following Caroline Telfair Hotstetter, who is this very wealthy woman who married wealth, married money, or came from wealth. She's definitely the richer person that we're going to learn about here. They are traveling first class on the RMS Lusitania. We find that out at the end of the chapter. But really, a bulk of Caroline's chapter is spent at least in my opinion, getting to know Caroline and Gilbert, her husband's marriage. One of the things I knocked on a lot was in this chapter, they say at least twice that Caroline is capitulating to Gilbert's wants. And that to me, I was just like, Caroline, no more. Stop doing that. No more capitulating. (laughs) In the first chapter, we're already capitulating that much. So no more, Caroline. Just Do what you want to do. She clearly loves her husband. There's still love there on her side. She definitely wants Gilbert to give her more attention, but she's perfectly fine taking attention from someone else as well, which she does when someone else steps in to dance with her. It's her old friend whose name is Robert, who we learn even more about. And they have this very, like, romantic, intimate 
scene in the music room or something. They're playing a piano together. That actually has one of my favorite written quotes from the chapter. In chapter two, uh, it reads, it became a race with each of them playing faster and faster until they both collapsed in giggles as their hands came crashing down on the keyboard. And that's just the tail end of the musical journey that they went on in this scene. And I I don't know why, but that scene just struck me as really just well written. And I immediately understood their relationship or had many, many guesses of what their relationship could end up being from just that writing. It's very intimate. And I put in my notes, I put her old friend in quotes, Robert. <laughs> they seem very well matched, well suited. But what do you think about Caroline and Gilbert's marriage, Abby? I totally agree, EJ. And I was on the same page with you where I wrote Robert Langford, old friend, potential love interest, because maybe it might be that she switches to Robert, which I would be okay with because I loved that piano scene as well. And I know we were going to talk about which characters we most connected with because we had a chance to read one chapter from each. And I actually chose Caroline myself because each of the three women really seems to be on the cusp of something new, new opportunity, new potential. Now, Tess, who we're about to talk about, to me, it just looks like too much newness. You know, we'll talk about her, but like totally new country, new name. She wants to just change everything. And I'm not really ready for that much change myself. Sarah, her change looks more methodical, more academic, a new book. I don't connect with that as much either. But Caroline, her chapter, I noticed, included the most number of additional characters. Like we have her husband. We have Robert, her friend. We also have her maid, Martha Jones, who also I could see becoming a friend or an important secondary character. She was really interesting. So none of those relationships are perfect, but I think that her journey that she's about to go on might be a little more interpersonal in nature, which is what I connect to most right now, just connecting each day with other people. And so, yeah, I connected to her and enjoyed her chapter very much. Okay, so on to chapter three. In chapter three, we meet our last uh, protagonist, Tess. Tess is, well, she helps her sister and her father run heists and turn tricks on people. And in the chapter, they describe a job that they all did together where she dyed her hair and she had a German accent and she dressed up differently. So obviously she's that type of um, character. She can fit in a lot of places. So her whole thing is she actually is going to Caroline and Gilbert's party that they're having at their house. And it describes her going in, sneaking in to the servant's you know, door. Once she locates that, there seem to be some questions where that is in Caroline and Gilbert's house, which I thought was an interesting detail. And then Tess actually sees Caroline and Robert at the piano during the whole piano scene, which is described in chapter two, which we both kind of really love. So we see even more from her point of view. And we learn that really she ultimately is an artist who almost immediately says that she's struck by Robert and just wants to paint him. I remember like, like reading that or hearing that and thinking, oh, that's a strange thing to say. Like she just immediately wanted to paint him and his stance and his features and the way he looked at Caroline really resonated with Tess. So Tess is there to look for a a musical manuscript, an unfinished manuscript that is worth a lot of money. It's what Gilbert and Caroline kind of fight about in their chapter, and it is what Tess is there to locate, essentially. This ends up She's in all of these different situations she, where, of course, of course, people who impersonate maids always end up in these situations where they're spilling drinks or someone recognizes them or something like that. So she spills drinks actually all over Robert, who we've already met. He's really nice to her. They have a little bit of a moment and it becomes like a whole thing that she has to get away from everybody and 
try to figure out where this manuscript is. She didn't locate it in this chapter, so we still don't know where it is, but we know that that's what she's looking for. So Tess, Tess is the one I resonated with the most, probably because she's she's being told and being pulled in a lot of different directions, I feel like, like from her father and her sister. And it feels like she's the one who's putting a lot on the line. And I don't know if she's necessarily okay with that. So maybe it was her vulnerability that she showed or her wanting to get out. And we find out the very last line of her chapter is, you know, she's booked to leave on the Lusitania as well. So uh, all roads point to the Lusitania here for these women. So what about you, Abby? Did you, what struck you about Tess's chapter? Well, I am glad that you reminded us of the moment that Tess had with Robert because that had slipped my mind and it just brought me on to another idea where maybe Robert's going to end up with Tess. Yeah, Tess's chapter was the most confusing for me because she was the character sneaking around and sneaking in and out and I wanted to know how but I I just let that go for a lot of it and just let myself be immersed in the story and like you said her emotions and like the feelings and tried to just get to the emotional heart of it rather than feel like wait how did she get in the store and how did she know about this party and how, you know how and is this really plausible but I just when you think about the real I think story here much like any book the real story is the story of someone's heart or what they're going through their interior life a lot of times my favorite quote actually came from Tess's chapter and it is shards of crystal festooned the ground like Cinderella's slipper come to grief and I liked that quote partially because it was just kind of fun and fancy but it also gave me some big fairy tale vibes obviously there's Cinderella mentioned there but Tess too she had that vibe for me of like kind of a scrappy heroine from a fairy tale of old so I I enjoyed that imagery coming together with what I was picturing in my head I'm um, excited to see how all of the connections come together and to revisit our new friends Sarah Tess and Caroline in two weeks Absolutely. So as we've been saying, it's not too late to start reading along. This is a fast paced, fun book. And we want to hear from you as well. Send us an email with what character you're most identifying with, maybe a favorite quote, or even just your general impressions. We'll make sure to include your thoughts into our 